and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Hurts, and tonight, coming to you at 11.33 p.m. ET from the friendly confines of Columbus, Ohio, we are going to talk all things what just went down week five NFL Sunday. Got some injuries to go over, ramifications from that. Also, just want to go through every matchup, you know, go through the snap counts uh, a little bit in the backfield, big takeaways from the offense, you know, anything we should look at moving forward to help make all of us better fantasy football players in the future. So, uh, fun day games. Unfortunately, there was the injury bug out there. I want to go over that before we get into the games. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, through five weeks, got a whole lot to uh, learn and adjust and move forward with. So, without further ado, let's get to some of these injuries. Thank you all again for tuning in as always. So uh, first off, yeah, Dak Prescott out for the season. Compound fracture in his ankle. So, so unfortunate. You know, trying to push for a first down as he's done so many times uh, in his career and unfortunately just came uh, down like sideways on it. It it was very gross and very uh, brutal. He underwent surgery tonight. All the prayers out for Dak. Hopefully, he makes a full recovery by next year. Obviously, Andy Dalton is going to be the man uh, for the time being. Uh, with the Browns, Baker Mayfield suffered a ribs injury. X-rays came back negative, expecting him to be fine. But you know, wouldn't be shocked to see them continue to embrace the run-first offense, both as long as it continues to work and as long as Baker is a little bit banged up. Uh, Washington Football Team quarterback Kyle Allen suffered a shoulder slash arm injury. Didn't exactly get an exact uh, read on it, but. He apparently was cleared to go back in, at least according to the broadcast, but Ron Rivera stuck with uh, Alex Smith. I mean, whoever's going to be behind that offensive line moving forward uh, going to be problematic either way. Uh, Dalvin Cook suffered a groin injury, first play of the third quarter Sunday night. Uh, he came back for one snap, didn't look 100%. It was the Alexander Madison show. There on afterwards, uh, wouldn't be shocked at all if the Vikings do you know, try to get Dalvin uh, uh, at least some rest up until their bye. I believe it is during, it's hard to tell with these readjusted schedules. I believe the Vikings have a week seven bye, so Alexander Alexander Madison deserves to be a chalky waiver wire claim. Hopefully, all you loyal podcast listeners out there already have Madison on your bench. We have been highlighting him uh, since the offseason as one of the big four backs that would truly be a top 12 uh, PPR RB with their starter out, which now appears to be the case. Uh, wide receiver position, A.J. Green suffered a hamstring injury. So just for, you know, further cementing T. Higgins as the number one outside receiver in that offense. Uh, D.J. Chark suffered, suffered an ankle injury. Saw LaVisca Chenault really take over as the kind of lead and target getter once he was sidelined. Sammy Watkins hamstring injury. Hey, Miko Hardman, we've been saying it over and over again here. He truly is the one kind of wide receiver handcuff uh, in the NFL. And uh, with Watkins potentially sidelined, we will be seeing Miko Hardman at the top of waiver wire claims. Hopefully, he's already on your roster. Uh, Deontay Johnson suffered a back injury, enabling Chase Claypool to his four touchdown day. Absolutely absurd. But yeah, Deontay's going to be banged up. I mean, even if he's not, you know, we're expecting uh, Claypool to go out there and continue doing his thing, at least to some extent. But Obviously, removing Deontay from the equation does open up a large, large target share in Pittsburgh. Uh, Tyler Eifert suffered a concussion. I don't think James O'Shaughnessy is going to really be fantasy relevant, but something to keep an eye on with this Jaguars team uh, losing these top guys. As we saw in week three, uh, without Chark, you know, it kind of submarine the entire offense. So not exactly a unit that, you know, can just pick up when they lose talent, kind of takes down the whole uh, offense as a whole. And then just the uh, last point I would make, Michael Thomas got downgraded to out for Monday night, not because of the injury, but because he apparently got into an altercation at practice so I do hope we get uh, future notes out of that for comedy's sake and I hope uh, Michael Thomas and whoever he got into an altercation with are ultimately all right so those injuries might go a little more in depth as we get through the games but without further ado I want to start going through these games Uh, because there were only 11 today I was able to you know have an eye on pretty much every single play you know trying to watch two at once live and then uh, you know as soon as 4 4 15 comes around I'm trying to grind through uh, the game pass condensed versions as well so you know if you Hear, hear anything wrong, you know, feel free to at me on Twitter, at iHeartIt's. Let me know. We're all trying to get better here. But uh, the following is, you know, my notes and key takeaways from the game today. So, so first up, Browns beat the Colts 32-23. Uh, Baker Mayfield, absolutely awesome first half. You know, he and it was actually throwing the ball a lot. And we've talked about that this year where the problem with Baker being this really high-end fantasy quarterback isn't so much uh, – his own ability, it's the fact that his own ability needs to be so much higher to make up for the lack of pass game volume. Didn't see that in the first half. He had 28 passes. The problem was the second half went just two for nine uh, with two interceptions. Browns offense only scored three points. In the second half, they got buoyed by uh, Rivers having a pick six and then taking a safety in his end zone. So, hey, I mean, the Browns scored 32 points on a Colts defense that, yes, you know, we were throwing the fraudulent uh, term around before. I do not think this was, you know, the league's best uh, pass defense going into the game, but it's another test that, you know, we would have seen past Browns teams probably fall under. And at a minimum, you know, we 
know this run game uh, is truly a force to be reckoned with regardless of the matchup. So Baker, you know, good game. Two touchdowns, 247 yards through the air. We saw uh, Jarvis Landry get a little bit on track with 88 yards. OBJ, uh, 58 yards. Austin Hooper, team high, 10 targets, uh, 57 yards. But just don't get used to seeing uh, this much volume. And it really wasn't uh, all that much. And this, a lot of it came from the first half. So again, this team wants to run the ball. They're going to do that as much as possible. Uh, pretty much same, you know, kind of takeaway from the Colts side of things. I mean, even in a game that they were trailing uh, for most of the second half, Rivers only threw 33 passes. Two of them were picked, neither interception. Uh, you can exactly say a good thing about the pass. I mean, Rivers did have a couple nice deep balls, one to Marcus Johnson, one to Ashton Doolin. But, you know, with T.Y. Hilton, six catches, 69 yards on t- 10 targets, being really the only uh, passing game option to get any sort of consistent looks. It's just going to be tough tough to expect much from anyone other than Jonathan Taylor uh, in this offense. So that brings us to our running back discussion. Uh, Snap counts in this game. Kareem Hunt was at 69%. Dearness Johnson, 31%. But Kareem Hunt had 20 carries and four targets, dominating the usage. It was not this close, honestly. I mean, it was the Kareem Hunt show going the fourth quarter. And then he started dealing with some cramps uh, that did not appear to be serious and won't won't keep him out, you know, any additional weeks. But without those cramps, I think we're truly looking at an 80-20, 90-10 snap split situation. Situation. So, you know, we talked about this in the podcast this week where Deionis Johnson was not going to be the Kareem Hunt to the Nick Chubb that is now Kareem Hunt in this offense. And that was the case I hear. So Deionis Johnson... Really hope he didn't blow a bunch of fab on him. If Hunt just suffers a new injury and he's out, okay, that's fine. But that's not the situation we're in right now. Dearness Johnson is clearly the number two back in this offense. It is not a 1A, 1B situation uh, without Chubb. There is clearly the Kareem Hunt show, and he deserves to be treated as a top six fantasy running back as long as Nick Chubb is out. Uh, with the Colts, Jonathan Taylor, 56% snaps, 12 carries, 2 targets. Naeem Hines, 38% snaps, 3 carries, 4 targets. Jordan Wilkins, only 4% snaps. So, again, last three weeks, the Colts have been... Uh, trailing just by multiple scores going in the fourth quarter wasn't the case this week and because of that we saw it condensed to more of a two back backfield good signs for Jonathan Taylor um, moving forward I thought he looked good out there only had a long run of 10 but converting 12 carries is 57 yards consistent nice chunks and again we're gonna see bigger days uh, here on out from Jonathan Taylor he's still been in RB2 I'm mean, gonna start the year top 20 back but obviously uh, we have higher expectations here moving forward our uh, PFF Lily stat of the matchup is in regards to OBJ career high average target depth right now over 14 yards and his wide receiver rating which you know just kind of takes into account almost every single target and just not necessarily fantasy production but how valuable he is uh, to the team highest mark since 2015 the problem his yards per hour run is the second lowest mark of his career and it's the first time he's ever had a catch under 50% right now. So, you know, I like Beckham in the spot in DFS this week, but I maintain the same kind of view of him season long. He's unfortunately more of a boomer bust receiver than his talent suggests because of the offense he's in. So, Beckham, we're going to see the blow-up games like he had against the Cowboys because he's that good of a player, and they're using him in this, uh, you know, field-stretching role. But just realize this role isn't all that conducive to, you know, every week consistency. Uh, moving on, we got the Panthers defeating the Falcons 23-16, to continuing to look good. You know, a lot of it continues to be uh, because of Teddy Bridgewater. Um, tw- he ended up going 27 for 37, 313 yards with a pair of scores. You know, didn't see the rushing upside we saw last week, but still, I mean, this is going into this game, uh, Joe Brady was PFS number three a highest graded play caller and you know you just see this situation more and more week after week how good it is for Teddy Bridgewater and how you know happy he should be that he didn't you know take that Miami Dolphins not to crap on the Miami Dolphins uh, organization and there I, I think they have been you know looking a little sharper over the past two years some decisions they made but I'm just happy that Teddy has found himself in a good organization you know in a good passing offense because they're getting the most out of his talents right now in this Panthers passing game again you know facing with the less continuity than anyone going this year uh, it's amazing that we're in week five and they are already as advanced as they are. Uh, DJ Moore week finally came to fruition, had an awesome 57 yard touchdown where ran a little pivot route, got away from his guy and just outran everyone else. This is the wild part about DJ. I mean, going in, it's been the uh, reality that he's more the field stretcher guy in this offense. It's Robbie Anderson getting more of the underneath intermediate targets. DJ Moore's the one that was top 11 in air yards going in this week. But we saw with this game, I mean, in addition to those air yards, he has that yak ability that we've seen since his rookie year. So Robbie was still number one this week, 13 targets, only five uh, for DG, DJ. Robbie had over 112. I mean, he, I'm sorry, he had 112 yards exactly. But again, this is a two wide receiver heavy offense, continue to treat both both Robbie and DJ Moore as top 20 options at their positions. 
Uh, on the Falcon side, I think Matt Ryan, not looking good. He's struggling. Julio was out again. And, you know, I look back at some of his game logs from past years when Julio was also out. And he had to go back to 2016 to find that instance. And obviously, that was when Matt Ryan won the MVP. He was just fine without Julio that year. So I'm not saying that, you know, <laughs> Matt Ryan is purely a product of Julio. I don't think that's quite the case here. But I do think uh, if you look at this Falcons offense, they are just one injury away, as they have right now, from being, you know, very ordinary uh, at that spot. So, you know, we did not see Zacchaeus have the same sort of bounce back, um, not bounce back, just he had a good performance last week, wasn't able to con continue that on. Uh, Russell Gage looked a little banged up with his shoulder out there. He only had 16 yards. No receiver had over 30 yards, except for Mr. Calvin Ridley, who caught eight of 10 targets for 136 scoreless yards. So, you know, death, taxes, Calvin Ridley putting up numbers with at least eight targets in the game. We continue to see it. Uh, great stuff from him. Uh, looking at these backfields, Mike Davis dominating snap share, 83% snaps, uh, had a little ankle injury early on but was able to come through and continue playing guys out there you know Christian McCaffrey who uh, I won't go that far but truly like it's not just volume from Mike Davis he actually is making the most out of it he deserves uh, credit for doing uh, doing so I'll have another note on him in a second and then Todd Gurley 14 carries 121 yards and a score in addition to four carries 29 yards on the ground still only played 57% snaps when we saw Brian Hill and Edo Smith combined for 43% continue to siphon away some pass down work but Gurley to his credit, I know it's the Panthers and Packers rush defense. You know, it's hardly uh, the class of the league either. Uh, they had the good game against l last week. But, you know, Gurley, he's running hard when they open up the lanes. His 35-yard score, he at least had to run away from some people. I do think this is the ideal time to sell high on Gurley, you know, coming off a two-touchdown game last week and another good performance this week. Look, he's getting, you know, between 15 and 20 touches per game, depending on how things go. But we've seen when they fall behind, he is not getting the targets. And unfortunately, I just don't think he's going to see these this sort of cozy uh, matchup moving forward. So I, I think it was uh, PFF's own Andrew Erickson on our uh, Wednesday podcast this last week that brought up uh, selling high on Todd Gurley, and I do agree uh, with that assessment. Uh, PFF Lily stat of the matchup. So Mike Davis, you know, why is this Panthers offense moving the ball better with Mike Davis instead of Christian McCaffrey? I think we can all agree, Twitter jokes aside, that Christian McCaffrey is obviously the better talent than Mike Davis. And I think that might have, uh, you know, just that reality right there has a little bit to do with it because with McCaffrey, McCaffrey, so much of their offense, at least last year, with Kyle Allen, a quarterback, and you know, Scott Turner and Norv Turner calling plays, their focus on the passing game was getting the ball to Christian McCaffrey. 54% of his targets came on the quarterback's first read. That was the play designed to throw the ball to Christian McCaffrey. That's not the case this year. We see the ball going to Robbie Anderson or DJ Moore. Just 34% of Mike Davis's targets have featured him being the quarterback's first read. So, situation where, you know, when Davis is getting his targets, it's usually in well, within the constructs of of the play and it's getting to getting the ball to him space from so McCaffrey. I just think it was a little bit easier for defenses to kind of tee off on that and game plan against it. So hopefully McCaffrey healthy comes back in this offense, comes into the Davis role where he's still getting fed. He's still getting a ton of targets. Only Alvin Kamara has more targets than Mike Davis this year, but uh, he's just not for getting force fed them in the same way. And because of that, we've seen them be much more effective. Moving on, big time upset, upset of the day, uh, Raiders 40, Chiefs 32, awesome game. I cannot say enough good things about Derek Carr, everyone, and this is coming from someone that used to not be able to say enough bad things about Derek Carr. The guy's playing great this year, and you know... I've been trying to give him all the credit in the world for doing so after having some inconsistent uh, first years in the league. It's never really been about Carr's ability. It's just that he has not thrown downfield. He's been good when he does throw downfield. The guy just consistently rates um, and ranks towards the bottom half of the quarterbacks, not the bottom 5'10 guys in their deep ball rate. But this week, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the Chiefs just daring him to do so. Maybe it was John Gruden kicking his butt in meetings, but he decided to throw deep. In weeks one through four, Carr completed five of nine uh, of his passes to at least 20 yards downfield for 155 yards, one score. In week five alone, he completed four of six such passes for 219 yards and two scores. Henry Ruggs had a pair of deep catches, most notably a 72-yard bomb that Carr put right on the money. Nelson Aguilar had a 59-yard touchdown. Remember, last week should have had a 55-yard touchdown as well, but it got nullified on an iffy illegal formation penalty. 
Even on a third and 18, you know, Carr was able to buy a little bit of time and uh, throw a deep ball to a uh, freaking Hunter Renfro for 42 yards. So truly saw him, you know, with a more focused effort to get the ball downfield. And because of that, it helped open things up for Darren Waller, who had 48 yards and a touchdown underneath. Uh, and even, you know, Jalen Rashard and some uh, other guys in that uh, part of the game. So they couldn't run the ball, which we expect them to be able to do against, you know, the league's single worst defense and yards before contact allowed. But it didn't matter. All the credit in the world to Derek Carr. The guy's playing great. And, and, you know, while everyone is out there chasing Andy Dalton on the waiver wire uh, to try to replace uh, um, Dak Prescott, don't be afraid to go get Derek Carr. I think Andy's okay. He's always been a son of his parts quarterback, and right now his parts are, you know, playing at a very high level. But Derek Carr has been playing really well this year. They got some weapons. John Gruden's doing some good things. Don't sleep on this Raiders offense continuing to uh, provide a fantasy-friendly quarterback. Uh, in the backfield, yeah, Josh Jacobs ended up still, you know, dominating snaps, 64%, 23 carries, 70 Seven yards, two touchdown. Long run of just seven yards. I mean, he just could not consistently break free, but uh, was able to make the most uh, of the goal line opportunities with the two scores. Uh, Devontae Booker, shout out, having a 43-yard run, but was not consistently involved. On the other side of the ball, Patrick Mahomes, I mean... The guy throws for 340 yards, two touchdowns, had an interception trying to force the ball down the field on a fourth down. But, like, I'm going to put together a clip on Twitter this week. He had, like, five or six incomplete passes or plays that just didn't count that were just absolutely absurd throws. He had a pass that must have gone a good 70 yards in the air to Tyreek that barely got knocked down. He threw a 60-yard touchdown to Tyreek on, like, the second or third play of the game that got nullified on a pretty iffy-looking holding penalty. Just one, you know, kind of rollout where he's making defenders miss and then throwing the ball back across the field. One amazing play after another. Just amazing what this guy can do on an every week basis, even in a game you know that didn't go the way the Chiefs wanted. Obviously, it wasn't perfect for Mahomes. The guy barely completed you know 50% of his passes, took three sacks, uh, wasn't able to you know get the win. But uh, it, obviously, no, no concerns moving forward. And uh, this was just a game that really showed off uh, Mahomes's, I think, just overall athleticism more uh, than anything. So with the receiver core, you know, again, Tyreek Hill's day could have been much bigger if that that one touchdown would have counted. He did find the end zone anyway on the ground, which was good to see. Uh, but yeah, Sammy Watkins had that aforementioned hamstring injury. Because of that, you know, expect Miko Harbin to be out there uh, more and more often. You know, with with Sammy out, it's going to be Tyreek, Miko Harbin, and Demarcus Robinson in those three wide receiver sets. And Miko, as we've seen him out there, like the guy does not miss when he gets opportunities. So uh, looking at the backfields a little bit, Clyde Ebersolaire, 59% snaps, 10 carries, and uh, six targets. Daryl Williams had 41% snaps, one carry, and five targets. They like Daryl in the passing game, but like I'm not going to worry about this too much moving forward. Clyde, no, he hasn't found the end zone all that often, but again, this guy continues to rank among the top 10, top 15 backs in the league and most missed uh, forced tackles per attempt metrics. I mean, the guy is going out there. He's usually making the most of his opportunities. I mean, you know, catching uh, his two passes for 50 yards. I mean, I'm sorry, that was me, Cole. Catching three passes for 40 yards. Like, the guy's, it's not like he's getting touches and just falling uh, forward for two or three yards. You know, he's Showing off that LSU spin move. He's uh, making some plays. I know this was the game that we thought he was going to find the end zone a couple times, but look, you, you really want to sell the Chiefs featured RB1 like towards the bottom of his value right now. It's unfortunate he's only given us RB2 value like Jonathan Taylor, but also like Jonathan Taylor, the role is there that we want. Trust the volume. The production is bound to come inside of his high-scoring offense. Uh, so PFF Lily stat of the matchup goes to me, Cole Hardman. Among every player with at least 50 targets since 2015, Miko Hartman has PFF's single highest wide receiver rating. He's number two in yards after the catch per reception and number three in yards per reception. Truly, with Miko Hartman, like we just have not seen him have an extended role and not do something with it. The guy is great, and with Sammy Watkins potentially out of the picture for a little bit, expect big things to come from Miko Hartman. All right, so quick shout out. Uh, PFF and Sunday Night Football's Chris Collinsworth is teaming up with one of the best players on and off the field, 49ers All Pro cornerback Richard Sherman. The Chris Collinsworth podcast featuring Richard Sherman is available now wherever you find your podcast. They'll provide the most interesting football conversation in sports every single week. And sometimes that means the discussion will venture off the field too. Additionally, Chris will be taking a dive in the game of football as he sees it, inviting in the best and brightest to talk about everything that's happening in the great game of football. So mark your calendars. You not want to miss the best 60 minutes of insight this season so please check out uh chris and richard's awesome new podcast uh moving on though cardinals 30 jets 10 
Not the most exciting game of the day, I would say, but hey, we finally saw Kyler Murray boost that yards per attempt and really make some big things happen uh, in the passing game. 380 yards on 37 passes and also, you know, chipped in his nine carries for 31 yards and a score on the ground as well. I mean, really impressive. I believe it was second half. I want to say end of third quarter, but... At one point, it seemed like Kyler was just fed up with this being a game. Dropped back, just zinged it as far as he could downfield, down left sideline. Hawkins came down with it. A couple plays later, does a similar thing into the end zone. Hawkins comes down with it again. All in all, Hawkins caught six of seven targets for 131 yards and a score. Truly one of the game's uh, best wide receivers. Continue to fire him up as anyone's idea of a top three option at the position. The problem is, I just don't know if any of these other wide receivers are truly going to get uh, this every down roll because Larry Fitzgerald continues to play as many snaps as Hopkins and now Andy Isabella he's getting a little more run but that's coming at the expense of Christian Kirk so even though Kirk went out there five catches 78 yards I just don't know how sustainable that's going to be as long as they want to continue to get Fitzgerald involved and then we have Isabella and even Keyshawn Johnson uh, siphoning off some uh, work too so for now continue to stick with just Hopkins I don't think any of these other receivers are super necessary of a bench spot um, on the other side of the ball with the with the Jets, Joe Flacco, yeah, uh, not great. You know, he looked pretty good throwing to Jamison Crowder, uh, who had eight catches for 116 yards and a score on 10 targets. But other than that, you know, just kind of the Joe Flacco experience. Only Crowder was the only receiver with over 25 yards. My guy Chris Herndon had a bad drop. Sheesh. And uh, with the running game, Le'Veon Bell, you know, he did come back and play. Um, what was it? Le'Veon Bell coming back and playing 70% uh, percent of the offensive snaps, you know, having a team high 13 carries. And and getting a target, but just didn't quite look 100%. If his, that was his 100%, well, you know, he's not running away from anyone, and he's still, uh, you know, the feature back of probably probably the single worst offense in the entire league. So, hey, at least Le'Veon, you know, does have that workhorse role over Frank Gore, but Gore still got nine carries himself. I think Le'Veon, you know, it, okay, 70% snaps, like that's a good flex play, but honestly, he's going to be on that RB2 borderline because everyone in the Jets' offense is that nauseating the roster, with the exception of Jameson Crowder, who is out out here uh, doing his things over 100 yards in all three games uh, this year. Crowder is the one that we like, need to have in the top 25 uh, sooner rather than later. And by that, I mean this week. And we probably should have had it uh, last week. We d- I did give him a bump up, you know, after – after proving that the hamstring injury was a thing of the past uh, in week four. But truly, I mean, how many more times can Crowder have a big game? We just kind of say like, oh, yeah, potential upside uh, wide receiver three uh, this week. Jameson Crowder in this offense, you say what you will about Adam Gase. The guy knows how to enable a uh, high-end slot receiver going back to his days with Jarvis Landry, you know, even Eddie Royal uh, with the Bears in his, in his year with Cutler. So Jameson Crowder firmly fits that. He's doing big things. Fire him up. You should be starting Jameson Crowder in fantasy leagues of all shapes and sizes. Um, um, also on the Cardinal side of the ball. So Kenyon Drake found the end zone. Kyler took mercy on his soul and gave him a, a little one-yard uh, read option play. And actually gave the ball this time to get uh, Drake the goal line carry. Might not have been read option, but either way, gave Kenyon Drake a goal line carry and he got a score. Chase Edmonds was the more impressive back, though, by far. I mean, five catches, 56 yards, three carries, 36 yards. It wasn't like there's a ton of shake and baking going around. I mean, this Jets defense was just kind of allowing some wide-open rushing lanes that Edmonds was running through. But you know what? Uh, Big gains are big gains, man. And Kenyon Drake wasn't the one uh, exactly picking them up. So this still was Drake's backfield. He played um, 68% of the offensive snaps. Edmonds was there at 40. But, you know, seeing a little bit more two running back formations was good from Edmonds. And honestly, if Edmonds keeps up this five-plus target per game role, he's already carving out a little bit of standalone value on his own. So I don't think the takeover that a lot of people have been calling for, you know, is particularly imminent. They still like Drake. They're still going with Drake. Uh, But just realize Edmonds is looking good. And if Drake misses is any time or if Kingsbury you know decides screw it uh, we're going with Edmonds this is truly going to be anyone's idea of a fantasy RB1 moving forward Next game, we had the Steelers defeat the Eagles 38-29. Just incredible performances from not one, but two young receivers. So Ben Rosberger, you know, credit, three touchdowns. But I've been talking about this. Like, the lower dot, lower average target depth uh, is kind of causing the just overall ceiling of this passing game not be quite what we saw in the past. I mean, 34 attempts, 239 yards. Again, this is a great real-life game. The Steelers put up 38 points. Like, I'm not saying Rosberger can't uh, provide, like, a high-end real-life upside, but we're just 
seeing uh, him just not really have the same mindset on a play-by-play basis, which, again, is smart to win football games and to stay healthy and be out there on the field. But just kind of reminded me of uh, something I heard on a Thursday night broadcast. I believe it was Troy Aikman talking about Brady being with the Buccaneers now. And he said that in New England, when Brady was uh, passing, he would go from short to long. You know, if he looks at James White in the flat and he's open, he's throwing it to James White. He's never getting uh, to, you know, Chris Hogan or whoever's running downfield. Now in Tampa Bay, apparently, with Bruce Arians, Arians wants Brady to start downfield with Mike Evans and then come down to Keyshawn Vaughn or whoever is in the flat. So, you know, I'm not saying Rossberger has made that switch, but just to me, that was it kind of made sense to me that that's what I was seeing because Rossberger, he is out there. He's throwing a short way more often, way more willing to, you know, get the right matchup line of scrimmage, get the ball out of his hands, pick up a gain. He's not, you know, he, we, we still see a play every now and then where he's holding the ball, uh, shaking dudes off in the pocket before uncorking one. But, you know, career low, average target depth. Right now, he is, you know, more than happy to get the ball in the hands of his playmakers. And that playmaker is Mr. Chase Claypool. Seven catches, 110 yards, three touchdowns, long of just 35. I mean, it wasn't like he was just, you know, ripping off massive play after massive play. There was certainly some coverage confusion on a couple of these, but, I mean, come on. He also pitched in a rushing touchdown on the ground. I'm not going to sit here and try to take away from the guy's four touchdown performance. The snaps are right there. I mean, Juju is at 50, Claypool 47, Washington 46. Because Deontay Johnson got hurt with the back injury, I mean, this happened, but come on. Some guy doesn't score four touchdowns and then just get relegated to the bench unless you're, uh, what was it? Was it um, oh, that Patriots running back from primetime. Uh, I, f- I forget the name. But you guys know what I'm talking about. Unless you're that dude, Jonas Gray, was that it maybe? Unless you're that Patriots running back, you did not score four touchdowns and then hit the bench. I'm pretty confident Chase Claypool is not that guy. I hope everyone that had you know the offseason statement that Chase Claypool is a tight end, like ended that statement was saying he's going to be the best tight end ever because this dude is an absolute beast. And uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be more, more good things to come. Even if Deontay Johnson comes back, I would just be shocked uh, if James Washington keeps a spot in through wide receiver sets. Not even because Washington's been that bad this year, but Claypool has been that good. He deserves to be a number one wide receiver ad of the week on waivers. And I mean, at this point, you know, we're chasing production a little bit, but hey, we're chasing what looks like the best wide receiver on this team and honestly one of the best young wide receivers in the game. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to get too carried away with the fab potential, but hey, if you need a wide receiver uh, and you've been loading up, you know, 40, 50 percent potentially, this truly is a talented guy in a passing game with available opportunity uh, that you can probably be starting on a near every week basis. So go to the well with Chase Claypool, people. I love it. Uh, other side of the ball, though, Travis Fulgham season everybody caught 10 of 13 targets for 152 yards and a score like honestly the way he picked up yards was a little bit more impressive than Claypool and I don't want to take away from a four touchdown game both these guys were that good it was just that weird of a game and you know Fulham deserves all the credit in the world for finally being the first guy all season to show some chemistry uh, with Carson Wentz and this is kind of like the same reasoning uh, with Claypool I understand that Fulham like his every down role also came out of injury we know Alshon Jeffries gonna be back in a little bit Deshaun Jackson has an illness and a hamstring. We're still seeing what's going on there. Uh, Jalen Rager might not be out for the entire season, so we don't fully know what's going on with Fulgham. I mean, I do think Claypool deserves to be uh, scooped off of waivers ahead of him, but to me, it's a little bit similar to like the Justin Jefferson, T. Higgins situation from a couple weeks ago where, yeah, Jefferson was a preferred ad over Higgins, but we advise you guys, like, go out and try to get both if you can. These are both looking like talented receivers uh, with near every down rolls coming. So, you know, again, Fulgham, only guy on this team with more than 40 yards. You guys have watched these Eagles games. I mean, the passing offense has been a joke for literally the entire season, so they're not going to go against a guy that has actually given them um, some juice finally. So yeah, Carson Wentz, you know, the 258 yards and two scores. He looked good out there. It was honestly his best game of the season. Still had two picks, still took five sacks, but this was a can't-win matchup uh, for this passing game, and Wentz still was able to keep things close, you know, made a lot of big plays, you know, just kind of dodging the rush before getting the ball downfield. So, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic that once, if he can stay healthy, because he's still, you know, playing like, a, uh, I don't know how to describe it. I don't want to say chicken with his head cut off, but he's not showing enough, uh, you know, personal well-being to help this team because they need him to be healthy uh, to try to you know make a playoff push and just a more wide open than ever NFC East so Travis Fulgham behind Chase Claypool but both good ads a quick look at these backfields Miles Sanders uh, had a long 74 yard touchdown other than that had just six yards on his other 10 carries but hey you know found the end zone another time as well so two touchdown performance from Miles Sanders played 86% snaps you're not you're never benching Miles Sanders he's like Joe Mixon Josh Jacobs Clyde Edwards 
Edward Solaire. When we get these running backs that have these sort of featured roles and we're getting 15 touches per game almost no matter what, you do not take them out of the lineup regardless of the matchup. Continue to treat Miles Sanders as anyone's idea of a top 10 back. On the uh, Steelers side of the ball, James Conner, 60% snaps. Benny Snell, 21%. Anthony McFarlane, 7%. Jalen Samuel sitting there at 3%. Did continue to beat a James Conner uh, show overall. He had 15 carries. Benny Snell was second uh, with seven. Connor also caught three passes, so looks good out there. I mean, we, we see the lack of burst, and I mean, he only had um, he had the long run at 25, but on his other 14 carries, only had 19 yards. So, wasn't the best game from James Conner, but also not a situation where Snell's taking over anytime soon. As long as Conner stays healthy, as we've been saying, you know, throughout the offseason, he needs to be treated as a borderline RB1. So, uh, PFF Lily stat of the matchup. This season, only two wide receivers are averaging at least 3.5 yards per route run. To put that into context, usually, over the past five years, it's only been Julio Jones you know, among high, highly targeted people to finish above even three yards per hour run. So over 3.5 going into this week, only Justin Jefferson had this mark. He had a little bit of a down game on Sunday night. So now the only two receivers averaging at least 3.5 yards per hour run, Travis Fulgham at 3.8 and Chase Claypool at 3.53. Minimum 10 targets. We'll see if it persists, but truly both guys making a bunch of plays out there. So quick shout out sponsor and quick opportunity for all you all you loyal fans out there. Brought to you by pristineauction.com. Check out their daily auctions with $1 starting bids on over 8,000 football items up for auction. This is pristineauction.com people. Pristine Auction guarantees authentic, authenticity, excuse me, on every product. Use code PFF for $10 on your first invoice and thanks to the fine folks at pristineauction.com. We are currently giving away a signed Amari Cooper jersey. So rate and review the podcast and we will be choosing a winner next week. Thank you to the fine folks at pristineauction.com. Uh, moving on, we got the Rams knocking off the Washington football team, 32-20. Ah, man. Another chopper goes down for myself. I thought Antonio Gibson, this could be the week that, you know, they really go to him. And the reasoning, you know, explained in the articles on the podcast, I won't get too much into it. But, you know, an L's and L's and L thought with the switch to Kyle Allen, maybe they'd make the switch in the backfield and just try to, you know, really put the whole offense in a great position to succeed. But we did continue to see J.D. McKissick plenty involved. Gibson led the way, 56% snaps, 11 carries, 5 targets. But, you know, McKissick, 50% snaps, 1 carry, 8 targets. You know, not quite giving us... Not not quite giving Gibson that true CMC ceiling role that we're hoping for at some point. Honestly, in this matchup, you know, talking on the PFF pregame show, the thought was like, could Aaron Donald and like Jalen Ramsey single-handedly take over this game? Didn't think, you know, it would exactly go that way because, hey, we've seen other offenses at least move the ball a little bit. I just, you know, I wasn't didn't have too high of expectations for this Washington offense, but I thought, you know, maybe they could get over 108 uh, net yards on the day. Wasn't the case. I mean, Alex Smith, 9-17, 37 yards. He took six backs, uh, six sacks, you know, all the credit in the world for his comeback story, and he should you know, get the comeback player of the year award with that first snap. But my goodness, I mean, to have a 3.2 QBR in this game, I mean, it was just a disaster. Every single play was seemingly, let's see how quick we can get the ball out of the hands. And I mean, look, the offensive line wasn't helping matters, but uh, Kyle Allen did fare a little bit better before he was forced to exit, uh, you know, nine for 13, 74 yards. Pretty atrocious uh, all the way around. I mean, I don't want to spend too much time on this Washington football team offense. It was a disappointing day. Terry McLaurin, three catches, 26 yards. So, they will have better days. You know, Aaron Donald and company were just able to wreak havoc from the beginning. But just a good reminder, you know, with these Jaguars, with the football team, with all these teams with so little going on uh, on offense, at least and in terms of just overall talent around the field, do not underestimate how, you know, one personnel change can uh, kind of submarine the rest of the unit. With the Rams, this backfield just keeps on evolving. Uh, Daryl Henderson was, you know, getting really chalky last week. Had the good run in week, uh, you know, weeks two and three. Comes out this week, plays well again. Forty-four percent snaps, fifteen carries, four targets. But Malcolm Brown was right there at thirty-eight percent, eight carries, two targets, and Cam Akers eighteen percent with nine carries, zero targets. Akers did show out, had a couple nice runs, even uh, broke one for uh, forty-six yards. We were showing some tackle breaking ability, and Sean McVay came out after the game and said Akers will be more. 
involved next week. Three-headed mess. And, you know, and look, you can. It, there's worse things to have than a running back getting double-digit carries or at least touches per week inside the Rams offense. But I don't think any of these guys are going to be able to confidently fire up as top 20 RBs uh, anytime soon. Uh, Jared Goff, you know, credit to him for continuing to do his thing when given time. Uh, this year, he is 7 for 10 for 224 yards, four touchdowns, and just one interception on throws at least 20 yards downfield this season. Uh, we saw this today on a gorgeous 46-yard touchdown or excuse me, uh, 56-yard touchdown to Robert Woods. Uh, Cooper Cup also had a 49-yard gain on a nice little slant and run. But yeah, I mean, when Goff does decide to push the ball downfield a little bit and he has time and it's a well-schemed play, he can certainly do it. I mean, I'm sure McVay, part of the reason why he loves Goff is because he's not this, you know, kind of off-script uh, quarterback that's going to consistently try to do things on his own. He loves to go by the play design and McVay must love seeing, you know, his ideas and his head be brought out to life by Jared Goff, not trying to go off-script all off. And so... I don't know if they're a match made in heaven. I still wonder about the overall ceiling of this offense. But Rams, you know, four and one, all four wins against the NFC East. NFC East uh, with the, I think they, yeah, NFC East only has, I think, uh, four wins themselves this season. Absolute joke all around uh, from that division. Uh, last thing I will say with this game, shout out to Gerald Everett catching all four of his targets for 90 yards. The Tyler Higby train, you know, he had that three touchdown week early on. It seemed like he'd be okay. But honestly, Gerald Everett looks like the better one out there. And they are using him as the uh, higher end receiver. So Higby, he's not useless or anything, but we got to kind of get him out of that top six, top seven range. He is more of a borderline tight end one moving forward with this usage. Uh, PFF Lily stat of the matchup. 91% of the Washington football team's receiving yards were after the catch. They had a 4.2 yard average target depth on, um, as a team. Those are both season low marks for any given week this season. Again, I mean, a great story with Alex Smith, but if this is the way this offense is going to function, uh, we're not going to be able to use anyone in fantasy land. Uh, moving on, Ravens beat the Bengals 27-3. to This was a beatdown. Mentioned before, uh, you know, my quarterback rankings article last week that, you know, Burrow, we have this game. We have two more matchups against the Steelers, I believe, in Week 10 and Week 15. And other than that, Fire Rump is a QB1. But this was not the week for it. Luckily, the second Ravens matchup comes in Week 17, so we don't have to worry about it. But look, he got pressured on 54% of his dropback. Like that's not going to work for pretty much anyone, particularly not uh, Joe when his receivers are struggling to separate as well. Obviously, he did not have a good game. He did not make uh, good decisions out there. Threw uh, you know one horrendous pick, had another bad pick, and you know taking seven sacks. I've done some studies this year on you know quarterbacks with high pressure rates and quarterbacks that also have quick release times because some guys like Joe and like Dwayne Haskins are actually getting the ball out pretty quick despite the pressure but you know seven sacks or seven sacks unfortunately we got to live with this offensive line uh, for the season with Burrow and company so Joe Mixon uh, couldn't get things going 24 carries 59 yards but but people the usage for Joe Mixon was very encouraging seven targets 77% snap rate in a game that the Bengals you know were down multiple scores for almost the entire time so the fact that Mixon played this much over Giovanni Bernard, who only played 23% snaps, two targets. Great sign that they are truly giving Mixon this every down roll uh, moving forward. And look, I mean, if you... I know we already had the breakout game against the Jaguars. I mean, the time to acquire Mixon was a few weeks ago. But if people are still kind of looking at uh, this game and wondering if Mixon can be that top back, if he has this type of usage moving forward, we're talking legit top five potential. I mean, okay, we'll probably rank him you know, closer to that top eight, top nine range. But either way, this is definitely someone you want on your fantasy football team. Uh, other side of the ball, Lamar Jackson, two carries for three yards. This was the only other start that he's had with fewer than even seven rush attempts was week one in 2019 against the Dolphins when they just didn't even need to put the foot on the gas. I think they had like 42 points by halftime. So it's concerning for fantasy football land. I mean, okay, 19 for 37 passing, 180 yards and two scores. They won 27 to three. I mean, this wasn't an issue in the game. I understand why Lamar uh, didn't necessarily feel the need to take off, but you saw the game playing them, you know, giving Mark Ingram 11 carries, Gus seven. They weren't putting Lamar, you know, as many kind of option situations, it seemed like. And Clearly, the knee problem that you know has been told us that wasn't that big of a deal throughout the week, and it wasn't a big deal in that Lamar was out there starting, but it's impacting the way he's going to be running around a little bit. So until we see a game where Lamar is going to go out there at double-digit rush attempts again and you know be used as the true you know game-changing talent that he is, it's going to be tough to treat Lamar as a top-five quarterback at the position in some of these weeks. Like, look, he's still going to be starting if you have him out there, but you know for those that are just blessed with these incredible problems like Lamar Jackson versus. Uh, you know, Josh Allen, 
Kyle Murray, Patrick Mahomes. I think I'm going to have to take those guys. And yeah, he'll probably still be in the top five. I, mean, I think I'm probably overreacting a little bit, but just truly what makes Lamar Jackson so special as a fantasy football quarterback is his rushing floor and two carries and, you know, even five, six carries is not going to give that same sort of floor and that same sort of locked in uh, overall QB one treatment. That's all. It's not that Lamar is going to, you know, fall apart as a fantasy quarterback without this, but it could be a difference between, you know, consistently ranking him as far and away the number one guy and, you know, putting him closer to that number five. Five range. Uh, running back room remains an absolute mess. Ingram, 31% snaps. Team high, 11 carries. Gus Edwards, 39% snaps. And J.K. Dobbins, 29% snaps with just one carry and three targets. Dobbins, one carry, goes for 34 yards. I mean, the guy looks awesome out there. And again, it's not like Gus Edwards and uh, you know Mark Ingram are liabilities at all. I mean, Gus didn't have his best game, but he's been playing some good ball all season. I do just wonder at some point, like you can tell that Dobbins is the second most explosive guy in this all, third most explosive guy in this offense, maybe second. Second, the Lamar Hollywood and J.K. Dobbins are the most explosive guys on this offense in some order. I wish they would uh, go more out of their way to get Dobbins the ball, but uh, you know he is someone that, while I would like to hold him on the bench in the hope that you know after a bye week or something they really do uh, scheme their offense around getting him. 12 to 15 touches per week. Uh, if you, you know, got, got these injuries and you just need to let someone go at bye weeks, uh, J.K. Dobbins is not someone that's going to be giving you much standalone value at the moment. So uh, don't mind getting rid of him if you need to. Uh, with the wide receivers, Marquise Brown finally found the end zone. Six catches, 77 yards, uh, and a score. Could have had another one potentially. Looked like he had some alligator arms, but you know, one man's alligator arms is another man's hospital pass. So tough to know who to blame that one on. And then Mark Andrews, six catches, 56 yards, and a score. This takes us to our PFF Lily stat of the matchup because Mark Andrews, league high, not tight end, league high, regardless of position, 15 receiving scores since week one of 2019. Mike Evans in second place with 14. Kenny Galladay in third place with 13. Mark Andrews is a legit flex, you know, and I mean that in terms of like DFS, like you don't need to treat him as a tight end. This guy is a legit high-end producing stud receiver. Obviously, he's number three tight end, you know, weekly behind Kelsey and Andrews, but just truly, it's not just at the tight end position that Mark Andrews is great. Regardless of positional designation, Mark Andrews, fantastic receiver. All right, everyone, we have four more of these to get through. Thank you for sticking with me. Moving on to Texans Jaguars. Texans won 32 14, first game in the post Bill O'Brien era. And, you know, Deshaun Watson showing some of his uh, vintage kind of off script goodness. Uh, ended up picking up 25 yards on the ground. Good to see. He looks healthy out there and he looks athletic. And, you know, when he's out there doing his thing, having fun, uh, rolling out and making plays, he's pretty tough to stop. So it wasn't perfect. You know, had uh, two interceptions out there, but only taking one sack was able to kind Kind of keep the offense uh, consistently ahead of the change and get a uh, change and getting everyone involved. I mean, look, I realize this Jacksonville Jaguars defense, all sorts of injuries. And even before the injuries, you know, they're not exactly someone to fear, but uh, good to see Brandon Cooks go for eight catches, 161 yards and a score. Will Fuller had four catches for 58 yards and a score. Uh, Darren Fells, 44 yard touchdown, more or less a broken coverage, but either way, you know, haven't seen much uh, production out of this Texans passing game this season. Good to see them put that all together. Now continue to treat Will Fuller, as you know, this borderline wide receiver one, top 15 option at the position. He had the goose egg in week two, hamstring induced or not. He's now had, you know, four or five weeks this year where he's put up big time numbers, you know, with over 100 yards or a touchdown. So continue to fire up Will Fuller and Brandon Cooks. We know that, you know, these types of outcomes are available, which is great. But we also know what happened last week uh, with the goose egg is there. So I don't think he's quite as locked in as Will Fuller uh, at this point in terms of, you know, having that weekly floor. But, you know, it is a good reminder. And after last week, you we didn't exactly pull the plug on it because he was still out there every snap. It was just a good reminder and a good matchup what anyone can do uh, when they're on the field full time with uh, Deshaun Watson. So Randall Cobb only six catches, 47 yards. I think it should be, you know, Fuller, Cooks, Cobb ranked more weeks than not, but. We'll see. It's going to depend on the matchups, but as we've talked about, the Jaguars do have a lot of enticing, I'm excuse me, the Texans have a lot of enticing matchups coming up. Uh, in the backfield, David Johnson, 17 carries, 96 yards, uh, no scores, and then have one catch for 11 yards uh, through the air. He should have had a receiving touchdown. Like he was wide open. Deshaun Watson had time and he just sailed it on him. So it was another performance from David where, you know, was a little bit better than I think uh, the stat line gives him credit for. 
Ultimately, he was putting together some nice runs. Towards the end of the game, he played 78% of the offensive snaps. Duke Johnson was out there for 29%. I mean, last week it looked a little more like a 60-40 situation, so it was good to see David get back up there to 80%. Obviously, we wish you know, there were more touchdowns, but like these other backs, I mean, again, people, uh, we just don't want to be sitting guys that are going to be flirting with 20 touches in high-scoring offenses like this. So keep going back to the well with David Johnson. I mean, look, he looks better than Kenyon Drake, and I know that's not saying a ton here, but uh, I do think David Johnson is finally going to get some bigger days, even though this Jacksonville Jaguars game was the matchup uh, we were looking for there. I mean, hey, if you can package him with someone for a fair deal, that's fine. I'm just saying, please don't trade David Johnson for some, you know, boomer bust wide receiver three option because the amount of running backs that are getting 20 touches per game compared to the amount of receivers that, you know, maybe getting five to eight targets per game. Uh, it's just a, it's just a l- large gap between that those groups. So it sucks, everyone. But, you know, again, you're, pro- you're not going to be able to sell David at the peak of his ceiling right now unless there's a good deal. I would continue to go back to the well with him. Jaguars side of the ball. Gardner Minshew cleared 300 yards, two touchdowns. Interesting game. I mean, I know the Jaguars lost by 16, but truly, like they they had a fourth and one where James Robinson uh, tried to pass. It was kind of a weird design play, and they had another uh, stopped on fourth down later, and a couple miss, at least one missed field goal. So. A situation where I think a couple plays go differently. Uh, this would have been a closer game. And yeah, you know, Minshew, it wasn't bad. Could have been a little more interesting. But with DJ Chark and the ankle injury, it's troubling. We saw what happened in week three. I mean, the Texans defense was nothing to fear. Uh, so I'm not too surprised that, you know, Chark not being uh, out there all that long didn't immediately come back to bite him. But, you know, if they're facing someone tough, uh, just be careful and assuming, you know, that because of the extra targets that LaVisca Chenault or Chris Collin are going to do with a lot of them, we know there's a low floor with this offense. And that's kind of a caught up to James Robinson today. I mean, five catches for 22 yards and there are 48 yards on the ground. Uh, that's a perfectly fine floor game. But again, anyone in this Jaguars offense, we know this can be the floor uh, when it comes time to, you know, make a start sit decision. Make sure you're, uh, if it's close, make sure you're picking the team or the player with the higher projected team. So uh, PFF Lily stat of the matchup. Want to give some more uh, credit to Will Fuller. Just one drop all season. Someone that's kind of had that uh, unfortunate designation falling around ever since college. And 2.06 yards per route run. That's the second highest mark of his career. Again, the goose egg in week two. But other than that, we've, we've seen him go eight catches, 112 yards, four catches, 54 yards, and a touchdown. Six catches, 108 yards, and a touchdown. And most recently, four catches, 58 yards, and a touchdown. So on pace for 70 catches, 162 yards, and 10 scores. Will Fuller is healthy. It is beautiful to see continue to treat him as a top 15 option at the position uh, moving on this one caught everyone by surprise Dolphins 43 49ers 17 Jimmy Garoppolo got benched but look this was not it was a performance thing but this, this, this is what Kyle Shanahan from his uh, words after the game watching how we were playing as a whole and watching how he was playing you can tell Jimmy was affected by his ankle I know he doesn't normally throw the ball that way and I think he was struggling a little bit because of it the way the game was going I wasn't going to keep putting him in those positions knowing we were going to have to throw it a lot to come back I think it hurt him from being at his best so yeah Jimmy sucked out there too Brutal interceptions uh, towards the end of the second quarter where it did seem like he got benched purely on performance, uh, you know, base metrics. And hey, 1.4 QBR at, uh, you know, before being pulled at halftime. Just absolutely miserable stuff out there. But, you know, CJ Bathara comes in and uh, 9 for 18, 94 yards and a score. Wasn't exactly looking all that much better. I mean, this was just worst case scenario game for the 49ers. Something they were, I think, due for uh, to some extent with all the injuries they have on defense and even offense and what they're trying to play through. So, you know, credit Raheem Mo- 11 carries, 90 yards, uh, had a 37-yard gallop. I mean, this dude is just so... So fast. I mean, you see him rank uh, the only guy with more yards before contact this year is Kyler Murray because most of I mean, he's just running away from dudes half the time. And yes, okay, part of that is also Kyle Shanahan consistently sending him up, you know, with his uh, great scheme and all that. But Raheem Mostert, I mean, truly one of the more electric guys in the open field with the ball in his hands. Uh, with the receivers, I would just note that Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, and Debo Samuel were out there uh, more than everyone else. I mean, both all three of these guys were playing near full time roles. That wasn't a guarantee with Ayuk. And we know we did see this get backed up with the targets. Samuel had eight, Kittle had eight, and Ayuk had six. So 
while it wasn't, you know, the best performance from this passing game, it is good to see that we actually have some clarity in what's been a muddled, uh, you know, pecking order throughout this season. So Kittle number one, and then Debo and Ayuk are pretty much serving as this year's version of uh, Debo and Sanders behind uh, Kittle last season. So better days will be ahead for this 49ers passing game. It does sound like, you know, hopefully uh, Jimmy G gets a little bit healthier and he can start for them next week. Uh, big story of the game, though. Ryan Fitzpatrick got back to gunslinging. So mentioned this in the pods last week, how weird it was to see Fitzpatrick ranking, you know, a Drew Brees in terms of just the lowest deep ball rates in the league was not the case in week five. In weeks one through four, Fitzpatrick completed completed just three of eight uh, throws, at least 20 yards downfield for 69 yards, no touchdowns and one pick. Week five alone, he went five for six on those passes for 199 yards and two touchdowns with zero INTs. Making plays all over the place. Preston Williams had a 47-yard catch. Mike Jasicki had a 70-yard catch. Parker had a 28 and 22-yard catch. Just one drop in the bread basket after another from Fitzpatrick. Great game by him. And, you know, with kind of the calls for Tua going out there, it wasn't surprising to see uh, the artist knows Fitzmagic pull a rabbit out of his hat one last time. Man, I got going there. I enjoyed that. But uh, Devontae Parker uh, had a nice touchdown. Preston Williams scored a touchdown. I would just say don't expect, uh, you know, this many guys to kind of be relevant week to week again like I'm talking about with these bad teams uh, you know we just got to kind of stick to the guys we know are going to get a lot of targets week after week that wasn't Devontae Parker this week I mean he only had three targets we saw Gaskin have five Jacecki had six and Preston Williams uh, had five so you know while Parker didn't rise up this week when we saw in weeks one through four how much Parker was the guy and we do still have the same snap concerns with Jacecki and Isaiah Ford in the slot that existed before and I mean I'm not going to let one game uh, change the opinion that Parker is number one over Preston Williams so credit to Williams and Jacecki and you know when we do want to maybe go with a you know low owned DFS stack with Fitzpatrick we can stack him with these guys but moving forward I think it's just Devontae Parker and Mr. Miles Gaskin we can trust wild thing with Miles Gaskin everyone the big problem with him the usage is all fine. The touches are fine. He looks good out there. I mean, not amazing, but it's not like he's a, a Kalen Balaj pl- plotter out there or anything like that. But the thing with Gaskin was Jordan Howard, truly one of the league's only vultures. And I've talked on this podcast about, you know, vultures usually being a term that's overstated in fantasy football. Usually, whoever gets inside the five-yard line stays on the field unless there's a timeout or a weird stoppage of play, and that person gets the rush temp if they decide to do that. But with the Dolphins, we were just seeing them really leaning on Jordan Howard inside the five-yard yard line he was a healthy scratch so we saw miles gaskin get all those carries inside the five yard line he's gonna be someone that you know i've been kind of treating at that rb2 borderline that's what he's been producing as but next week he's going to be a top 15 20 back as long as we can you know assume that howard is going to remain a healthy scratch. So Matt Breida, you know, wasn't gone or anything like that. We had uh, Gaskins at 60% snaps, Breida at 34%, and Patrick Laird at 15%. But look, Gaskins, he's the lead pass down back. He's the lead early down back. And now he is the lead goal line back. So very rare to find that type of triple threat running back throughout the league. Uh, do not be afraid to keep him in starting lineups and uh, maybe buy low if you can get someone to throw him in a trade. Uh, PFF Lily matchup stat uh, among 56 players with 100 rush attempts. Raheem Mostert. This is 100 rush attempts since 2019, including the playoffs. So yeah, I'm including Mostert's awesome playoff run. Excuse me. But among these 56 players, Mostert is tied for sixth and missed four tackles per attempt. He is third in yards per carry behind only Lamar Jackson and Kyler Murray. And he is also tied for sixth in yards after contact per attempt. So truly, Raheem Mostert has been one of the best players with the ball in his hands over the better part of these last 12 months. Quick shout out to our sponsors at Monkey Knife Fight before getting to these last two games. Uh, any any first time depositors that go to Monkey Knife Fight and put in at least twenty dollars in their account while using promo code PFF will receive a free PFF Edge annual subscription. That's a forty dollar value for just twenty dollars, and you get the chance to turn that twenty bucks into even more money playing daily fantasy and prop games at one of the fastest growing fantasy sports sites in the USA. And Monkey Knife Fight. So go to Monkey Knife Fight and deposit your twenty dollars with promo code PFF today to receive your free PFF Edge annual subscription. Love the people and find folks at Monkey Knife Fight. All right, Cowboys beat the Giants 37-34. Talked about this before. So unfortunate with Dak. Compound fracture and dislocation in his right ankle, trying to fight for some extra yards. I mean, this has always been, you know, one of just the, I think, top qualities with Dak. And it's dangerous, but, you know, you go back to that Seattle win in the playoffs when he went flipping head over heels on, like, the third and 15 to get the first down. Just so many other times where, 
there's been a linebacker or a safety, you know, three yards ahead of the first down marker. And Dak, who's always been a big dude, who's never missed a game, you know, just puts his head down, tries his hardest to run him over. And I'll tell you what, a lot of time he gets there. So this play, you know, just getting outside, I honestly thought he had a chance to turn the corner. He was throwing one of his good stiff arms, and unfortunately he got brought down uh, awkwardly. So per PFF's uh, Mario Pilato, the injury isn't career threatening, which is good. It did require uh, surgery Sunday night, you know, just prayers up for Dak. Hopefully things get better, but it will be the Andy Dalton show moving forward he did good in relief 9 of 11 passing for 111 yards you know, certainly benefited from his receivers making some great plays, but hey, that's the reality he's in right now, and honestly, Andy Dalton has always been a sum of his parts quarterback in 2015, which was his best career season, that was the year the Bengals had A.J. Green, Muhammad Sanu, Marvin Jones, and a healthy version of Tyler Eifert. And he wasn't spectacular, but he got the job done. This was the most prolific we saw him uh, be with the Bengals. I think we'd all agree that this offense is even a step up above that uh, with C.D. Lamb, Amari Cooper, and Michael Gallup, and obviously Ezekiel Elliott in that run game. Would just note that, come Come on, guys. We're going from Dak Prescott to Andy Dalton. There's going to be a drop-off all the way around. And don't forget this offensive line without their starting tackles. It has not been the same unit uh, throughout this season. So, you know, Dalton on the waiver wire, I get it. I think he's going to be a top uh, 15 quarterback here more weeks than not. But, you know, I would not go out of my way to blow 50 percent, 50-60% fab on this guy or anything like that. Two QBs leagues, if you really truly need someone, okay, I get it, but you know, I would be surprised if Dalton's going to be someone that's going to post consistent uh, top 10 fantasy numbers inside this offense. You know, Maybe they just need to lean on him more than ever uh, with the passing game, and we know this defense isn't getting any better, but uh, you know, wouldn't be shocked at all if we just see them try to force feed Zeke, maybe even get Pollard a little bit more involved and take the game out of Dalton's hands. I mean, look, it's still Andy Dalton here, and I know he hasn't been playing with the best teams in Cincy recently, but you know, just can't overstate how good Dak is. This is anyone's idea of a drop-off. It's going to impact the entire offense. The Cowboys are objectively a worse team without Dak Prescott under center. And, you know, hey, maybe CeeDee Lamb, Amari Cooper, Zeke, uh, even Michael Gallup, who made some fantastic plays uh, down the catch. These are great players. They're going to keep making big plays, but at a minimum, you know, just these thoughts of particularly the passing game, uh, just having this consistent high-end production, I think it's going to be a thing of the past. You know, Zico Elliott, he's going to continue to be a top five back because he's got that coveted early down goal line and pass down back role that we're looking for. So, uh, you know, things don't change too much with Zeke. Maybe even his touchdown equity potential uh, goes up because if you just kind of look at uh, his career, you know, Dak has been someone that's more than willing to take off rushing near the goal line. But on the other side of the coin, uh, you know, the Cowboys will probably be inside the 10-yard line a little bit less without Dak leading them down there. So uh, troubling there. And yeah, you know, if you need any Dalton, I get it. But, you know, I would just say like Teddy Bridgewater, even Gardner Minshew, these quarterbacks that have, you know, we have a little more. Uh, look, a little more sights of them in their offense, at least in uh, 2020. I would be willing to go with those guys over Andy Dalton. Again, please don't break the fab uh, on the artist known as the Red Rocket. On the Giants side of things, Daniel Jones looked better, had some fumble issues, ultimately didn't find the end zone, had only 220 yards passing. But, you know, two short rushing touchdowns kind of uh, end up being why they got there. And Daniel Jones did drive them down in the deep territory. So credit Dar- Darius Slayton having eight catches for 129 yards. But... Nobody else had over 50 yards receiving. I mean, Devontae Freeman, 17 carries, 60 yards, was able to fall into the end zone once. Didn't even have a long run over nine yards. I mean, it was a situation where... Best possible matchup, you know, credit to Freeman for racking up 87 total yards. But, you know, hearing uh, kind of Romo on the broadcast talking about Freeman showing off this, you know, new juice and all that. I mean, look, we saw Dearness Johnson have an awful lot, lot of juice against his Cowboys defense uh, last week. Still not a situation where I think we should be looking to really consistently roster anyone with this Giants offense. I mean, even though they did have uh, the 34 points, a lot of this was uh, in large part thanks to some of the turnovers from the Cowboys offense and just the Cowboys defense being as brutal as they are so you know Giants it will be easier matchups moving forward but uh, some of these you know 2019 big game stats from Daniel Jones this was the week we probably should have seen that and you know hey we did see Darius Slayton and uh, Freeman have doable games but even these guys I mean Freeman to me he's gonna be more of a touchdown dependent RB3 and moving forward he still only played 53% of the offensive snaps we had Deion Lewis taking away pass down work and Wayne Gallman uh, staying involved as well so 
At some point, I think they're going to realize that Gallman is a better option at the position. But for now, Freeman, again, he's you know going to be at best an upside RB3 in this offense. Uh, PFF, the late matchup stat, uh, Zeke is on pace for 19 touchdowns this year. That's what I was talking about. You know, Maybe with Dak being gone, they actually could lean on Zeke just even more inside the five-yard line. But just interesting that he's gone 16 touchdowns and then 9 in, 20, in 2017, 9 in 2018, and then 14 in 2019. So Zeke truly is finally having that season where his touchdowns touchdown regression is getting up there with his just absurd workload that he's always have. All right, final matchup here. Really fun Sunday night game. Seahawks beat the Vikings 27-26. Vikings had a 13-0 lead at the half, and then Russ came out and just started cooking everybody. He hit Disley for a touchdown, Metcalf for a touchdown. Had another chance for one to uh, Metcalf with a better ball in his defense. He was under a lot of pressure on that play and, you know, kind of gave him a chance to run underneath, but wasn't quite able to get there, so... It was just scary how quickly this offense got back in track after a first half where they weren't really able to do much. And, you know, Chris Carson took a carry up the middle, broke a tackle, and scooted on in 29 yards to a score. But 27 second half points from the Seahawks, you know, seeing Russ uh, put up the points in that much of a hurry. This truly is, you know, maybe the scariest team in the entire NFC, them or the Packers. I think we'd all have to agree those are the two favorites for the time being. And yeah, I can't say enough good things about DK Metcalf, too, because on that last drive, uh, you know, I don't know if it was 20 or 30 targets it was probably closer to five or six realistically but truly Russ just you know with the game on the line fourth and 10 from inside his 20 he just lofted one up to Metcalf for 39 yards and then you know in fourth and five at the end of the game he went to Metcalf, and this was right after uh, Metcalf had a drop. Some people actually thought it was a touchdown. I did think the defender kind of got their arm in there, but I mean, honestly, who knows? All I know is that Dez caught it, but regardless, they went back to Metcalf on the fourth and five. He was able to make a nice catch, even better throw from Russ. So, you know, the Russ to Metcalf uh, combination. We're going to see Lockett, you know, continue to have big day, big days, too. He only had four catches for 44 yards uh, tonight. He'll, you know, turn around. He'll have some bigger performances moving forward, but truly, you know, DK Metcalf, anyone's idea of a top five fan receiver at the moment as long as Russ is truly leaning on, leaning on him as his undisputed number one. On the Vikings side, this was the first time all year that Kirk Cousins had to air things out. I mean, 39 pass attempts. I uh, was talking, you know, going into this, how he was throwing downfield, but just not very often. Fewer than 30 attempts in each of the first four games of the season. And, you know, credit to Kirk for making uh, some big-time throws. They didn't get a lot of explosive plays, so he had to consistently uh, kind of work the intermediate areas of the field. None of it was easy, but Adam Thielen, nine catches for 80 yards and two scores. Only had a long of 14. Justin Jefferson, three catches, 23 yards. Irv Smith, four catches, 64 four yards so you know not the biggest performance from everyone but again uh, we did see Kirk put them in a position to win and the Vikings did have a fourth and one you know, right right at the two-minute warning pretty much, where if they would have picked that up, uh, would have put them in a chance to uh, just leave with a complete victory. So I like the call to go for it. Unfortunately, you know, Madison got stuffed on the attempt, but, uh, you know, Kirk Cousins did do enough to win this game, which is unfortunate. It didn't work out that way for him. Uh, with the Vikings' backfield, so yeah, Dalvin Cook, first touch of the third quarter, uh, exits with a groin injury, and Alexander Madison came in, had 20 carries, 112 yards. Mike Boone only had two carries for 19 yards, and uh, Madison also had three targets targets so did a lot of podcasts this summer, but probably the most informative one I did just for my own, you know, learning more about fantasy was with a uh, Vikings beat writer. And one of the questions I asked him was, okay, if something happens with Dalvin Cook and, I, and we have Alexander Madison stepping up, do you think he's going to have the same Dalvin Cook role or are we going to see Mike Boone come in and take some early down work or even Amir Abdullah come in and take some pass down work? And he could not have been more, you know, assertive about Madison being the three down back if Dalvin Cook misses time, which is looking like that is certainly on the table right now and you know the big point he made was that the coaches were just so impressed with the strides Madison had made in pass blocking and how they felt you know comfortable leaving him on the field for all three downs now which wasn't necessarily the feeling they had in 2019 so truly Madison I've been preaching this all offseason there's Latavius Murray Chase Edmonds Tony Pollard and Alexander Madison those are our core four backup RBs that if something happens to the starter these guys are going to ball the hell out and we were going to see that with Madison if Dalvin misses some time. All right, everyone, that's going to do it. Thank you all for joining me, as always, on the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I am Ian Harditz. You can find me on Twitter, at iHarditz. You know, articles coming out every day of the week. New pods coming out every day of the week. I love football. I hope you all do, too. Always, you know, trying to give you guys the best possible content, best analysis out there. Hopefully, I can get some, hit some predictions right along the way, help make us all some money. So thank you all again for tuning in. We will be back with a uh, podcast Tuesday morning, wrapping up Monday Night Football and going over some 
some waiver wire stuff. So until then, take care, everyone. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game, push the button. College football, push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.